thrilled to be joined by renowned artist Rafik Anadol for his talk, um, as well as Vice President of Art Science Museum and Attractions on a Haja, who will be in conversation with Rafik um, for Q&A. Rafik's Glacier Dreams was introduced as part of Julius Baer's next initiative, which explores mega trends at the intersection of art, science and technology. And today's program brings us into his artistic process, where we will hear more from him uh, how his AI data, data painting installation illuminates the beauty and the fragility of our world's glaciers. We're delighted to have Honor start us off with opening remarks for the program. Please welcome Honor. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna, and I'm the Director of Art Science Museum. And I am thrilled to welcome all of you for a talk by one of the world's leading media artists, Rafik Anadol. Rafik is here to mark the launch of his new artwork, Glacier Dreams, which will be projected onto the facade of Art Science Museum throughout June as part of the iLight Festival. Shortly, Rafik will introduce this stunning new artwork and give us some insights into his practice. And following the presentation, we'll have a Q&A and that'll be an opportunity for you to ask Rafik your questions. Hailing from Turkey and now based in Los Angeles, Rafik Anadol has built up a reputation over the past decade as one of the world's most influential artists working with digital media and artificial intelligence. His practice operates at the crossroads of art, science and technology and it is therefore a perfect fit for Art Science Museum, an institution that fundamentally explores the space where these ideas meet. Rafit's work addresses the challenges and possibilities of ubiquitous computing and what it means to be human in a world of AI. His practice questions how our perceptions are changing now that machines dominate our everyday lives. Rafik has been using data as a substance of his art since his very first exhibition way back in 2009. But it was in Los Angeles while studying at UCLA with digital art pioneers like Casey Reese and Jennifer Steinkamp that Rafik's practice really began to take off. In 2014, he established the Rafik Anadol Studio to grow and enrich his creative ideas. The studio's first supporters came not from the art world, who tend to be a bit slow on the uptake with digital art, but from tech. Rafik was an artist in residence at Google and has partnered with Microsoft, Panasonic, Intel, NVIDIA and many more. As his reputation for creating innovative digital art at scale grew, Rafik's work began to be shown in some of the leading art institutions around the world. He's exhibited at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the National Gallery of Victoria in Australia, and Art Basel. Last year, his work unsupervised at MoMA in New York caused a sensation and continues to captivate hundreds of thousands of visitors. Working outdoors with architecture has been a dominant part of Rafik's practice. Last year in Barcelona, he noted, landmarks have become my canvas. I'm interested in exploring the architectural domain as deeply as I can. So we couldn't be more thrilled that Rafik has transformed the landmark that is Art Science Museum into a canvas for his latest artwork, Glacier Dreams. This AI-generated artwork is inspired by the beauty and fragility of glaciers. It's the result of a long-term research project involving machine learning, environmental studies, and multi-sensory art. For its Singapore presentation, Glacier Dreams will be presented on the facade of Art Science Museum as an immense projection. Glacier Dreams is made of data, archival images, and images collected by Rafik himself on location in Iceland. These images have been processed through machine learning algorithms and are transformed into a mesmerizing visual experience. With Glacier Dreams, Rafik hopes to raise awareness of climate change and how sea levels are rising because of melting glaciers. 
This keen environmental concern is shared by our team here at Art Science Museum. In fact, our new exhibition, Sensory Odyssey, which opened last weekend downstairs, concludes by taking visitors into the Arctic to witness glaciers melting. One of the scientists that we feature in the exhibition uses auditory data to better understand how melting glaciers impact the rising of sea levels globally. The idea of making the impact of climate change visceral and visible feels important to us as a museum operating in the first part of the 21st century. Rafiq's presence in Singapore today is due to a partnership between Art Science Museum, Marina Bay Sands, the iLight Festival, and of course, Julius Baer, who have commissioned Glacier Dreams. We are enormously grateful to all of them for making this incredible project happen. We also want to thank Rafiq's studio team, including Dogo Khan, who's here today, um, and my team uh, for their work on realizing the project especially our senior producer, Demetrius Kontopoulos. It's now time for you to meet one of the true stars of digital art. So please help me welcome to the stage, Rafiq Anadol. Thank you very much. I deeply appreciate the words. And, and I thank you very much for the museum, for everyone, and Julius Baer for flying all over the, this is a beautiful part of the world. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, in this keynote, I'll do my very best as quick as to share uh, the journey as an artist and, and, and practicing in the field. But I want to start my presentation with someone we lost a couple of weeks ago, Peter Weibel, who was my hero. Um, at, as an undergrad who really pushed this idea of data as a pigment uh, in, in his class 2008 in Istanbul. And he was very, um, as a pioneer artist and a director of the museums at Kayam in Karlsruhe, he was a person, not only me, like many artists like myself, preserve media art and art science and technologies. And so I found that very meaningful to connect the worlds. So I think, uh, like, like many people, early ages, super inspired by um, imagination, also science fiction. I think, as William Gibson mentioned in this talk, I'll try to talk about digital and real or artificial realities, where we are, I think, all going together. Originally from Istanbul, Turkey, I think the city truly inspired me, not because of uh, the ancient culture around the city, but also the idea of like West and East connects, and physically, virtually, spiritually, uh, where really the past and the future, left and right, all kind of these feelings, I think, coming from the city itself. So got my computer eight years old and start very early ages playing games and start imagining with the idea of one day a machine can become a friend. While my mother was really skeptical about my mental health, honestly, I was just imagining about one day a machines can become a collaborator. And very much inspired by a movie, very early ages, and <laughs> I didn't know English, but my cousin uh, translated the movie for me. I am hoping he did a good job, but he said, that scene I remember when um, this android says that, or humanoid says that this is not your memory, this is someone else's. And I clearly remember the idea of seeing utopia, not necessarily dystopia, because as a child, I think we are all start our life as positive as possible, not necessarily rejecting the life of problems, but try to see the beauty and possibilities instead of like lost in the darkness of like things that may go wrong. Uh, early ages, 2008 and 9, I started my progress through a software called the VVVV. In my undergrad years, it was a very powerful moment of like thinking about the idea of architecture as a canvas. And I'm also grateful for Elev Manovich, who is a very powerful person who is sharing his ideas. He, he wrote an amazing article, A Poetics of Augmented Space, and he was mentioning that one day artists and architects can come together to discover the politics, poetics, and structures of invisible patterns of data. Um, and again, thanks to Peter Weibel around these first MFA studies of Sana School of Building, and then over the years, Arts Electronica. And like early eight, 2008 and 10, I have been like very fortunate to create many public works, architecture as a canvas, light as a material. But 2008 also very inspiring day to me because I, I really found it so powerful to think about data as a pigment. And when I think about the pigment, it's, it's not, I think, so first of all, data is not an information to me. Data is a form of memory, and this memory can take any shape and form. 
And it was very early days that I really obsessed by these noise algorithms, like fluid dynamics, and many things that you will be seeing in my work. But I think what was contextually inspiring me, not necessarily data itself, but how, how we are using data as a humanity, and how we are every single day connecting each other. And of course, this idea of machines, softwares, hardware, systems, every single day taking our, all our attention, and that's where my attention became so much focus on the space where we can't even focus, where the physical and virtual worlds connects. So I do believe that our society and our future and our past is completely changing because of how we are living our lives right now. I mean, every single decisions, every single algorithms in our life, I'm pretty confident many of you like this in your phones, in your machines, and I'm pretty confident that many of us lost our control context. So while all this happening, and while this sense of displacement happening, I really found that it's so powerful and important to think about the big question of what does it really mean to be a human in the 21st century? So this species will learn how to use Instagram in just five seconds. But it's really the question is like much deeper than um, any of us can answer. Some people say the answer is a journey, but I think it's beyond that. So my journey from Istanbul to Los Angeles started 2012 and then decided to study at UCLA Design Media Arts Department where I got my second MFA degree on the topic of media arts and architecture, and specifically focusing on AI and data. And in my practice, uh, very grateful for Casey Rias, who teach me how to code very early days of processing, and then or beyond that, Frank Geary um, was back in time, who was also teaching there, Greg Lean, and many heroes at UCLA. But to me, my heroes also, my team, who are, they are my giants, I'm on their shoulders. Right now, we are a studio in Los Angeles, and we are now 20 people can speak 15 language and 10 countries in a small space. And last literally nine years, I guess now, um, we explored the topics around specifically public art. You will see a lot of pieces open free and um, they don't have like ceiling, they don't have a door. They are somewhere on earth uh, practicing in the public spaces. Um, the studio was a dream when I had started my journey because I knew that I'm not a egocentric um, uh, person to like, Try this journey, I was really inspired by the idea of going together somewhere very far, but, but being sure we are far, not necessarily rushing fast. And I think over the years, our focus was uh, public data sets, specifically not private data sets, and you will see many cultural beacons across the world. And if that idea comes from one philosophy. I do believe art should be for anyone, any age, and any background. I do believe that art is not elitist context. And art is humanity's capacity of imagination. And it's much more powerful sometimes when you witness an art in a hospital, in a school, or in a, like an airport. So I always believe that um, that's where the truly understanding of creativity can be unleashed um, beyond the places. So that was one research. And in my practice, I really believe that art, science, and technology are powerful mediums and, and AI, neuroscience, and architecture can come together. And I mean, we, I, I think it's a very powerful thing, like humans, machines, and environments are coming together all the time. Um, so Hiroshi Iti like says, art questions the world around us, science explains the world around us, design articulates the solution, technology enables the solution. I think they are all connected to each other, and it's really impossible to separate, I think, in the next decades as we are living beings. 2016 was an important day because I think, um, maybe you remember or not, but literally this image on my left side here you are seeing is the very first image leaked to the internet from a Google blog post. It was the very first time people like me loving AI but can't use it, was finally seeing a machine hallucinating an image of a backpropagation algorithm. Um, to me, that was a big moment because like, okay, finally there is a hope, a possibility for an artist to just really learn about AI beyond just that high-tech companies, dream billion dollar whatevers. And that's a really important moment that uh, Google opened this residency, 2016 February. I mean, seven years with AI, believe me, feels like 70 years. And it's especially like, you know, many of you are aware of the generative AI and large language models. But to me, the all fundamental research in this residency was super strongly about consciousness. And uh, by the way, it was a very inspiring residency because people sometimes think, oh, it's a Google, you just get the best code, best you know, hardware, that's it. It's actually not like that. It was the opposite. And I was kindly challenged them to like, what happens if we have a neuroscientist, a shaman, and an engineer in the same room with the artist to like ask the biggest questions 
we need. Um, the first installation was inspired by the Library of Babel by Borges, and I hope one day every single data in the world exists. And in Istanbul, we created 2016-17, the very first public AI artwork in a publicly available um, library in Istanbul. So this was a pretty much very first time 1.7 million documents coming together uh, in, a, in an immersive environment, as you may see. And when you go to this library, it starts with not a search bar, it starts with everything. Every single image exists in this library becomes a, a kind of a performing arts in front of you. So simply machine learns all this information and then uh, asks you the question, what else do you want to see? I, I felt this so inspiring moment because libraries are where we learn our truth, our past. Of course, if a machine can learn, can it hallucinate? And what will happen if a library that tells the story of reality becomes a hallucination machine for AI? So again, seven years ago, these questions were weirdly maybe not relevant, <laughs> but now I'm pretty sure hallucination keyword for many large language models are a nightmare, which I personally love them so much. And what was really inspiring to me, not only VR, AR, XR, but the idea of how machine, like for example, on the left side, images are collected by six researchers for nine years. And on the right side, in less than nine minutes, AI sort the same information. So there is an incredible, powerful potential of possibility of AI is an extension of mind. And also, I'm obsessed with data pigmentation now more than, I guess, 14 years. But to me, on the left side, I mean, again, these are very ancient looking images. But imagine seven years ago training a neural network with a million images. That's what I was able to get from neural network. But to me, that was not the end point. I think the moment of data pigmentation is not just an image from an AI. I do believe that that's a more beyond that. So on the right side, these are very early studies of uh, fluid dynamics getting a real-time input from AI and transforming that pig tick pigmentation into three-dimensional worlds. This aesthetic is where I started my journey. I saw a lot of people doing similar things, but just the origins of, I guess, how the early generative AI models becoming uh, these inputs for this AI. Um, and last seven years, we download more than four billion images. It is, a, I think, one of the significant part of our studio. We download many images, but we also curate those archives. We only focus collective memories, thus, such as urban, nature, culture, and space. We always try to focus the clean data sets, which sometimes take six months. And the fundamental research in the studio last seven years is understanding latent space. When machine learning algorithms create those data sets and learnings and embeddings, and it's basically this black box problem. There is pretty much no way to interact, truly understand every single machine decisions. I mean, recently, yes, ChatGPT, Midjourney, Stable Diffuse, all these tools are just giving us an interface. They are not still necessarily showing us how exactly that specific decision are made through all that worlds of like neural networks. So that's our research for the last seven years. And we create many softwares. Um, these are like, for example, a, a latent space browser that allows me to fly in a, like, in a neural network. And this can be a diffuse model, this can be a GAN model, and I can able to like, you know, reconstruct those realities and click between different spaces. For example, here, an AI model trained on a Renaissance architecture, which allows me to like, click at moment interior, go to exterior, and create these hallucinations between spaces. And while doing it, you have like a parameter base, you know, uh, details, like there's nine layers of neural network that allows me to like predict and also you know, uh, animate and the decisions between how many frames. Like these, all these parameters are becoming a kind of a, to me, a thinking brush. So last seven years now, it explored this aesthetics of machine intelligence through fluid dynamics from generative algorithms with architects Saha Hadid's and Frank Gehry's and looked through the different patterns of aesthetics. But what was the, the only like really part that I love so much about these studies? Every single data, every single archive, create a new kind of pigmentation. But of course, this is just a, you know, very much creating boundaries around an idea. But as Carl Sagan mentioned, it's much more inspiring when we apply the imagination. So last, I guess now, more than five years, we are looking of also lower dimension reductions, which is a technique that applied in AI research. For example, this is Rumi's um, uh, 16 language Masnavi, re uh, read by AI, or understood by AI. So these are really, for me, one of the most inspiring part of research where we can see different 
concept and context and discourse of how AI can listen or hear, like here in Mozart, in this in this in this version, uh, listening entire Mozart's life and finding those patterns in six dimensions or seven dimensions, X, Y, Z, and R, G, B coordinates of the information becoming these neural networks. So. I mean, when we think about AI as a pigment or AI as a friend to create sculptures or like paintings, there's so much uh, room for innovation and aesthetics. But so far, these are like very much uh, early studies of like how we can take machine decisions into paintings, sculptures, and so on. And the other part of our research is, I guess, since childhood now, but media, embedding media arts into architecture. It's a, a profound research still going on. And 2017, and uh, right after the uh, Google residency, I'm very grateful for our friends at NVIDIA. Our pets crossed and pushing the computer graphics, pushing the AI research. That's how our pets crossed with Jensen Huang and beyond. So 2017, we started going a little bit much more advanced in computer graphics. And the first exhibition we got commissioned by Artec House in New York was the Machine Hallucinations New York. And this one was 117 million, 130 million images of the city of New York. And again, like seven, six years ago, like getting this amount of data, um, curating that data, creating this algorithm was something. But to me, what was really positively inspiring, like 2017, 18, again, very early days of immersive environments, we were able to create this 18-channel um, installation in, in a former um, boiler room in Chelsea Market. It was a 32 channel sound uh, with a company with an 18 channel like um, um, projection. And the music you are hearing is also from the back in time RNNs from the Google Magenta team support. We were able to create this generative AI model from the sound that our um, sound composer a friend Kerem Carollo was able to create this soundtrack. Um, the piece was well received, but just before the pandemic, uh, it was closed. And later on, I think it became a canvas for many other media artists. Uh, to me, this was one of the early uh, pioneer world of like understanding being in the mind of a machine and transforming the neural network architectures into a storytelling and go beyond. So Archive Dreaming and I think this project for us as a studio are highlights of the certain uh, research. But over the last uh, now nine years, we transform many locations into canvases and transform them into uh, uh, living surfaces. But one of the most, of course, challenges were cultural, be cultural beacons. Um, as, an, as a student, while well, dreaming about this one day may happen, the idea of transforming Frank Gehry's Disney Hall, which is a cultural beacon for uh, Los Angeles, but also uh, home of LA Philharmonic. So the problem with this building, 2012, when I moved to Los Angeles, the first thing I did was see the building, and it was super sad because at 2 a.m. at night, they shut down all the lights, and I go there with my like, biggest inspiration and motivation. It was my <laughs> so sad that zero people on the street, zero light on the building. So that's where I just stuck in this idea of, oh, I hope one day this building can remember and dream and hallucinate. 2013, got my Microsoft Research Award from Bill Gates and the jury, and that's where I just start thinking about one day I will projection map this building. So that happened, 2018. Uh, it was a very challenging project. We used 42 projectors, but most importantly, take the Frank Gehry's legacy design from a Katia software, and then transform the building into these different like parts and transform the skin of the building, as Frank Gehry calls, and turn it into a projection doable um, surface. And this took, of course, significant time because the, the softwares and the 3D files were very much not ready for these complex ideas. And then 2018, we were able to transform the building into a public uh, canvas and uh, brought more than 100,000 people together. And most importantly, I think it was a 100-year ceremony for the LA Philharmonic. Uh, so we use every single recordings in their archive, every single image, sound, and text data. Um, and we were able to create this generative soundtrack. Uh, and it was a Google Arts and Culture project. With their support, we were able to compute the entire 100 years into uh, kind of a material. Um, wh but what I learned here so much is like, truly the power of public art, coming together and remembering the meaning of the building. And to me, like Frank Gehry's building is not just a building. I think it's a sculpture we live in, like in this building, beautiful building. Uh, so that's really inspired me so much, how we can connect the building's memories and experiences to the facade. And uh, also the, the Hadith, another hero, like they are building in Seoul, in DDP. So we just worked so much around this idea of like augmenting buildings across the world and transform them into uh, cultural beacons. And 
All this research eventually lead us to a Venice Biennale architecture, where uh, every two years, architects speculate the future of or the past of architecture. And two years ago, uh, we were very, uh, I guess, fortunate to become one of the uh, participants of the Venice Biennale architecture. It was a pandemic project, very hard, very, very hard to imagine some ideas around something that you cannot even build in a physical world. And for this project, we focus on something very, um, to me, inspiring human connectome project. It is the largest data set ever available online uh, across uh, powerful institutions, MIT, UCLA, Harvard, and many others. These data sets has one of the largest emotional recordings of certain people from six months to 96 years old. To me, the project was like, can we live in our build, can we live in our emotions as a mean of like buildings? Like, can we turn hope into a building, inspiration into a building? Joy into a building. Uh, to understand this, we generate this AI model and train this um, entire data set and create synthetic like brain forms in the form of DTI and um, kind of tractographic channels between what happens when we have a cognitive function in our minds. So, uh, of course, it was just, you know, a heavy computer graphic research. And then we were also able to 3D print this form by using a large format robot and then able to speculate the idea of this um, connectome AI architecture. So it's a side research for a studio, being able to hopefully one day touch our memories and emotions. Um, it's a really fun way of imagining uh, what happens if we can leave uh, emotion as a, like a space or um, beyond. And the other practice for our studio in the blockchain era is like three years ago, as we all know, digital artists like myself and, and beyond, we got a significant um, reaction from the society. And I think I want to just focus very quickly um, our couple of projects. Um, last three years, very inspiring moment happened. Uh, and we tried to bring our ideas to these potential NFT projects. But I want to explain something interesting about that. Um, because of my uncle's Alzheimer's, I'm heavily inspired by the idea of uh, memories. And unfortunately, or fortunately, there are some solutions to this problem. And last six years, we were very fortunate to work with neuroscientists such as Adam Gesley from UCSF. And what you are seeing is a, a live software. It's not just a shiny pixels. It's a functional software that a scientist can use this to recognize the moment of remembering. By using 32-channel EEG data and more than 800 people's um, recording data, we were able to classify the moment of remembering, positive, negative, or neural, uh, more ne I guess, meditative space. And last year, uh, Lausanne Hospital donated five data sets of five children while their brain mental activities get healed. So we got this data set of healing in their own terms. And we take this data of hope and transform it into this data sculpture, AI data sculpture, and commissioned for UNICEF and donated to the UNICEF. And this piece you are seeing is an NFT, and it was a 1.7 million euro donated to UNICEF. So what I wanna say is sometimes even the most controversial algorithms or techniques or technologies can create a much bigger impact than we can imagine. Um, and then later on, uh, same year, last year, we also donate uh, this SpaceX collaboration project, Inspiration for Mission, for astronauts', astronauts three days a journey in the space. And this collection also sold for uh, $2.5 million for St. Jude Children's Hospital. So we literally um, preserve and secure one day of entire day of all the families and their children. So it's really powerful to think that blockchain can bring people together, the art can bring people together, and that allows people like us to like channel this old value back to the society, which I think uh, more inspiring than a boring product and service or some you know tech bro conversations. So that's possible. And then also during the pandemic, the focus became more about nature. Like all of us being at home was a big problem. And the question was, we could go to nature, but can nature come to us? Not necessarily mimicking reality or not necessarily like saying physical world is worse or better. I love physical world more than ever, but can we somehow get inspired by this moment of using AI's capacity and possibilities? Our collaboration with Bulgaria was one of the early examples and that was like a 17, 75 million flower species. And more than, by the way, 16,000 species exist in the like nature based on the Smithsonian archives. We were able to create this AI model by using that data. And, but what was to me more inspiring is like, yes, we could create an AI with like this flower data. We can make somehow hear the sound of the nature, but could we smell these dreams of AI? And that's where our research started to become, I guess, shifted to the multi-sensory world. 
This is a machine that is uh, real time taking 40 notes of AI decisions by a perfume generated by an AI. Um, it's called Charlie, by the way, from a firm managed company. It's like leftover AI project, very weirdly, um, for many reasons. And then this AI can be able to use to like watch another AI and come up with like formulas. So imagine you step in this world that when you open the door, that can reconstruct the images, the sound, and the scent. So this research is a part of our Glacier Dreams also, evolving every single project. But not only just in an immersive room, we also bring it to the stage by creating a performing art center in a performing art context. And the same AI in real time respond to the music while the concert have its own like a perfume and moment of like creating audiovisual performances in real time like life. Or on a building, you can imagine also that case the real time data from the weather conditions and transform a building. And I guess all this journey is going in, in a way, but I think one of those inspiring projects was also happened, um, I guess, in two years ago. Again, thanks to Keza Rias, the hero, and also the Paolo Antonelli and Michel Kov and MoMA. This time the challenge was slowly becoming much more focused into the art making, the idea of like chance, the control and beyond. So MoMA has one of the most unique uh, artworks in the world, 138,000 incredible um, minds and souls who have created many disciplines across like painting, sculpture, photography, game. I mean, in this archive, there's Pac-Man Tetris. So just please like don't think as just a, um, um, certain categories. So we took this data and thanks to again NVIDIA friends, we were able to create a custom AI model from scratch. Uh, from scratch meaning like using the style GAN algorithm as a base, but from scratch we create a new algorithm architecture that takes this data, not necessarily mimics the reality, because our idea was not make another Monet or a Van Gogh. That's a very predictable, very boring path of, I think, current AI research. To me, what was more inspiring is how can we use the fantasy, the hallucination, the dream, the context of like not using exactly how the AI models are creating. And this was one of the um, uh, challenge of the research. And then over the uh, months, we were able to go beyond that. Like here you can see on the left side, AI is real time creating these forms. And on the right side, real time getting this data and transforming in data pigmentation. Like you remember seven years ago when I was imagining one day like these machine decisions or dreams can real time can come. Uh, finally, it took some time but the computation allow us to uh, take this to a new level. And the work is in three chapters. Uh, on the very left and the middle ones are constantly real-time created um, on, on, on based on the data sets that is coming from the live uh, sensors. And then if you go to the lobby, as you may see, there are a camera and a microphone and a real-time weather data influencing the artwork in real time. So this is, for example, three different scenarios happening on a med media wall next to the piece. Uh, you can completely see how exactly which sensor is affecting which work and why the, why the, why that, why are we seeing that specific color on the, on the current stage? Um, loud morning, silent morning, silent night, or like a pff, action on the lobby and so on creates this kind of patterns. Um, and, and I really find this very inspiring to look at the history of modern art from any perspective. Um, and then um, the piece um, have been extended, I guess, now four times after a, a positive reaction from the audience. Um, and I think most importantly, beyond me, this was very good news that artists like myself, people thinking like myself, I think has now a chance to practice their work. And um, I guess the gates of the possibilities are opening, uh, which is very, I think, good news for digital artists. The other research we have been very proud is World Economic Forum collaboration. Uh, last year, uh, we started this research by fine-tuning an AI model with 100 million coral images. This is not a just shiny pixel research, not like another, uh, I guess, prompt uh, engineering. It was truly a, a purpose for creating almost realistic corals to be 3D printed and put underwater to transform them into a living beings. As we all know, the climate change makes the coral reefs are dying rapidly. And this project for the UN Ocean Preservation Team and the Miami uh, Coral Reef Team to turn them into potential research. So it was a really, really powerful to be at the World Economic Forum and show this research and, and get the attention of the world leaders uh, to go beyond just techno fetish research of AI and ask the questions, how can AI be truly helpful for humanity? 
And two weeks ago, we were again in, in, in Barcelona, and I want to come back to our project here in, in beautiful building. And I really love this quote from the Gaudi, originally consisted in returning to the origin. I think it's really powerful to imagine that sometimes uh, the buildings and their connection with the city is so powerful. So for this project, it was a very long dream, the living architecture, the idea of, I hope one day, buildings are beyond concrete, glass, and uh, I guess, uh, steel and structures, we decided to like, take the speculation of the idea of using UNESCO Heritage Building data set, which is a one billion plus um, perfect, I think one millimetric accurate uh, point cloud data of the facade and merge it with a real-time weather station and create this dynamic artwork. So specifically, when the weather is rainy, it is a rainy, when it's windy, it is windy, and so on. The weather patterns of the, the, the city uh, affecting the facade as this living, you know, skin uh, uh, and a live surface um, to be transformed into um, a data sculpture, I guess. But what was really inspiring to me two weeks ago, uh, again, we did the same performance and we were able to get this um, incredible audience. So we use um, 5,000 luminance projectors, and, and also we augment the each uh, Gaudi's uh, signature balconies as like light sources. Um, the piece is 50 minutes. Uh, one part was a real time getting data from the weather condition, weather station, and then um, using the historic, uh, as you may see, the three dimensional uh, LIDAR scannings of the UNESCO heritage uh, data. And we were able to cut through the historic Gaudi's like literally uh, section designs. So we were able to see from the facade, like how the building is becoming this like see-through surface where we can see his like decisions from hundred years ago. I think what, what was truly powerful to me, the idea of using public art in our practice was something, but bringing 65,000 together was really special. Uh, and I think um, there are some of those moments with the city and the context of like the architect and, and the meaning of the buildings. When they connect, there are some magic happening. So we are looking for those magics around the world as well. So the project today, the reason we are here, Glacier Dreams, also the continuation of all this research. Um, I want to also be thankful to, one more time, Julius Baer for commissioning, and also our curator and advisor, Hans Ulrich Obrist. He is a truly pusher, so last three, four years in my practice, and he said something very powerful that, like, after all these, and as we all know, the generative AI is creating some problems because how to be sure that we have the original data when training those AI models? So for that reason, he really pushed us to this edge and like what happens if we collect our own data. So that was a very big challenge, by the way, not a comfort zone, not like online images that we can all download and create another AI model. In fact, um, this is a journey, not finished. We are still on the way, <laughs> on the road. So we collect 110 million images and 10 million images of them is like completely with our studio like resources. Uh, the, first the first stop was Iceland, which there is 269 glaciers. Um, and each glacier has a very unique patterns, colors, forms. They are living beings, bless you. And, and what was really so amazing is like go and witness the experience instead of like dumping images online, which is both important, but being there and feeling the weather from minus 40 degrees, eight kilometer long like pets, 50 kilograms of like gears around you, drones and cameras and climate data and sound data. I heavily advise any young or any minds who wants to try going out of comfort zone, that's out of comfort zone world. Um, so we are very grateful for the project to try something uh, fresh um, for our practice and bring attention to something important and meaningful. 
uh, and hopefully go beyond that. So our hope is um, in Singapore, we have a second tour, and then Art Basel, and then hopefully in London, unfold the whole story of the project into an exhibition. Um, so we are exploring GAN models, diffuse models, um, we are generating and working generating AI sound models, and we have a sense molecule script for the project, um, and it was like, uh, in, the, in the original form, is an immersive role, and I think I will be an immersive role. We are bringing some uh, inspiring moments, evolution from these pieces, to be on the facade of the museum. So we are very grateful for that, uh, bringing this project uh, across the world and, and, and bring the intention hopefully. And on the first entrance, um, in the entrance, you can see uh, the interview and you can see the behind the scenes, a lot of data and all that process. Because we believe that any, any human working with AI. Artists, especially, should uh, demystify their tools and process. So, after all these amazing years uh, as a studio, we are very grateful for the attention taken across the world. And after a uh, major thinking uh, about our practice, we also decided to like explore the idea of a museum as a like uh, as a studio. So, this is our humble uh, try, I guess, it will be uh, in, in, uh, in its own form. Uh, we are calling it Data Land. So we are hopefully opening our first version in Los Angeles, California. But for this project, uh, we want to try to push our legacy of research. And for this reason, we decide to focus on the rainforest, the lands of humanity. Uh, but it's not just similarly a glacier project, just using available resources. We decide to create our own AI model from scratch and donate to the humanity. It's an open source AI generated AI research. And our partners are people living in the rainforest, not necessarily from online research. So we are truly working with an incredible family called Yamanawa. They are living in present Amazonia Andre, and they are our advisors, not necessarily this VC or whatever big tech companies. We are working with the people living in those places, protecting for us. I do believe that this part of the resort project will give them meaningful and purposeful connections. And, and co-creating, I do believe, is one of the most powerful parts of where we are going. And AI research, AI research, especially for any field, will be transforming. New fields will be opening. We will be questioning what is creativity. We will be questioning what is real. I do believe that for that purpose, we have to start to think about where the humanity is going. But at the end of the day, I do believe that art is a powerful expression of humanity. And I think we will be using it to bring inspiration, joy, and hope for humanity. So thank you very much. I hope to see you.
starting their journey, I really saw very positive like reactions. And second is of course curiosity. I think curiosity is something like uh, very powerful. It's and beyond an academic context and beyond any teachers that we can know. I think curiosity is a self-driven, uh, self-motivation that comes from I guess. Uh, many things that, that beyond the system that we build. And that is how to unleash it is a little bit, I guess, a dialogue uh, from hard dialogues. Because right now I think the current challenge of social media is just generating this, oh, I wanna make the next product service to make whatever. That mindset is I don't believe creating an honest, true discoveries of or innovations. It's most like the shortcuts uh, culture um, that's there. <laughs> that's very, I think, uh, unfortunate. And I think, um, I don't believe it offers any creativity. It's more like creating you know, shortcuts. So how to do that, I think, is in the parents' uh, direction. But I also believe that I was clinically addict to, addicted to games till high school. And, and it was a powerful thing. I'm very proud of it because it really allowed me to go beyond the, the reality we have. Uh, and being in the games allowed me so much to, to, to create new meanings. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I know people are stopping games, but I think they may be the safest place <laughs> if they are well done uh, than any other social media. But I, I may be wrong, but I, I feel like they are great escapism for many people. Other questions from the floor? We've got one over here. Uh, oh, sir, can you just wait for the mic? Because we cannot hear you at all. <laughs> no, I, I just want to thank you. Uh, for saying that the uh, games are the safest place as a mother of a 14 year old here mm -hmm. Soleil, please no she's shy she's in the world of the game so but thank you so much that's very normal that's thank <laughs> you i'm sure she's not shy in the game 100 <laughs> percent i've got time to take maybe one or two more questions i think we've got one up the front here um and then if there's another one uh kind of we'll be able to take one more so my question is about your journey, um, especially when I think about all projects and the one that made the remarkable um, thing in my brain was the memory, like remembrance and the, the inspiration you got from your uncle. So those kinds of projects, as well as the Glacier as well, they have also a lot of science purpose. I mean, you get tons of data and I'm sure science is also looking after what you, what you guys are doing. But in the end, there's beauty versus there is science, right? So there are two different, like right brain, left brain, if you want. So in your journey, what keeps you centered into the beauty and not get consumed into the scientific part of uh, the, the reality? Wow, great question. It's a beautiful challenge, I think. So first of all, I think, as, my, my, as I mentioned, I mean, science questions a different world and art sometimes becomes a problem to the world. So I think they're really fundamental different approaches. But to me, beauty comes from that positivity that I'm hoping uh, in every work we do is about finding similarities, not differences. And that really holds us very tight in that possibility space, which I think there's a lot there. And that's where it comes from, the beauty, the positivity. I think sometimes what I saw, at least in a public art context, um, being um, too scientific creates a barrier between the public. Being too abstract also creates this, you know, less curiosity because it's so abstract. So in, in our AI work, again, if you go to like the first floor, you will see how we completely demystify every single data sets, where they come from, who invented that algorithm. I mean, that's our contribution. But also, for example, we work with a Harvard professor to visualize 36 terabytes of human cell because he couldn't, um, in his lab, um, Gokhan Otomishlikil, he's an incredible um, scientist trying to find <laughs> little lipo, lipo cells in a healthy and unhealthy liver. And it's, by the way, thousands of smaller than a, like a needle. And they have these 36 terabytes of cell recordings. And we help them to visualize for a nature magazine. So it's a really interesting that it's not visible here, but we do a lot of these kind of collaborations. Um, so it's a really, the balance is really yin-yang. Sometimes very abstract, sometimes very literal, and sometimes just the balance we are trying to form. But um, no formula yet. <laughs> I've got time for one more question. Um, we've got three hands up. Uh, I'm going to take one from this side of the room because we haven't had one from this side of the room. And then I've got something to ask you to wrap up. Uh, hi, Rafiq. Hello. Uh, I've met you, I think, a couple 
five years ago in NTU and uh, at ah, that point... Ah, that's the reason I was here. Yes, Three days. Yes, Crazy yeah. event. So like, uh, I think at that point of time, I wasn't contemplating about being an artist, but because I met you, uh, the opportunity of to be a new media artist opened up. Wow, so uh, good to meet not, you. <laughs> yeah, so you're one of the biggest inspirations for me. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, opened my own uh, creative art tech uh, studio. Congratulations. Uh, yes, yeah, just a small question. Uh, what do you do in your day-to-day -day when it comes to like, like manifesting all these crazy ideas? Yeah. Oh, okay, so first of all, congratulations. That event was amazing. I think three days, amazing PhD masterclass like presentations, 9 a.m., 6 p.m., zero energy left, end of the day, go back hotel, come back, right? It was amazing. Um, so I think, honestly, <laughs> Again, I'm grateful for my, first of all, partner, Epson here. I mean, she's a one compass in life. Working and living together is a one nice, another challenge on top of all that challenges. But there we found that, I mean, but we found that balance there. Like life is as important as all these ideas. I work 18, 16 hours, so it's not a normal, but uh, it, it's very important to like turn the life into a canvas. Uh, but that also comes with that risk of like, you only work, like there is nothing left, right? That kind of, um, I mean, the best balance we saw with research, research, like in, we are in the deep in the jungle sometimes, like with the jaguar and snakes, like thinking about the humanity, you go to the glaciers with like minus 40 degrees. I mean, they all are like meditations in life. They are not just a project or not like responsibility. Uh, mm -hmm. If you, I think me connecting the meaning and purpose with discovery and innovations, it creates this safe zone where you can find that comfort zone of imagination, spirituality, respect to like your life and everyone connects to our life. Um, but it's a practice. I don't have another formula, but that's where I'm trying to find that. And I think that's why we call it artistic practice, right? You know, is it, it is genuinely yeah. about from know, heart. Kind of Anything from heart, yeah. I think, makes that space. I've got one final question to wrap up um, where, you know, we're, we've seen some in, in quite some detail, actually, in your presentation, your journey um, in the use of artificial intelligence and how it's evolved over the last seven years in particular. You know, we can't have a conversation about artificial intelligence yeah. in 2023 without you know, referring to uh, the anxiety yeah. uh, kind of that many technologists have shared around yeah. the potential kind of dangers of AI um, kind of from a societal perspective. So you've coexisted with AI kind of um, for a long time. And from that perspective, I wonder if you could just give us your th thoughts about the current AI landscape and perhaps address some of those anxieties that some may feel. Yes. I completely relate to the anxiety, completely hear and feel the concerns. Um, and I, so two things I think very important. It all comes from data. Let's just remember it. AI means data. So, so remembering where data comes from, how it comes from, is the fundamental part where we understand everything about, I think, AI's basics. Now, the challenge is literally our collective memories we left behind, like literally on Amazon reviews or a TV or LinkedIn, wherever we've left our past memories are coming in front of us in the form of a product and service. So that's a whole weird thing that, that I think the whole world is now trying to understand that. The second challenge is, of course, privacy and free will is 100% on a stake. I'm not a visual thinker, I'm not a positive thinker. Things may ha definitely can go wrong because it's a powerful tool, a tool that can create problems. But this tool is simply a mirror for humanity. I feel like if we are aware of who we are, if we are 100% aware of how the humanity is, this is not any more risky to me. I mean, understanding who we are is where it all starts from. It just reflects who we are. Yes, we have bads, we have wrongs, we have mistakes, we have unethical world, and that's where the fear comes from. But the same technology's possibilities are beyond. Like everyone knows, DeepMind's gift to humanity, 200 million protein foldings, which will take 1 billion years of PhD hours, gifted to humanity. Technically, 
right now, same PhD students start their journey, can be the next Nobel Prize award winners for cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, because of AI. Who knows how many examples we can count for a powerful technology we have. I don't believe we as humanity can understand and solve this. I don't believe boring governments and boring regulations and a cheesy I agree, I accept will not solve this. No way. It is more complex. I think it has to be a global consensus. Every single human, every single living species, if possible, should be a part of that discussion to truly and honestly solve it. And our take on this really like we have to bring ancestral wisdom to the game. We as humanity create <laughs> like all these problems and then now we are trying to solve it. Oh, I think we need to bring truly the fresh perspectives. Um, and, and lastly, I think creativity will be questioned. Mm -hmm. We will be becoming the artists of artists, writers of writers, engineers of engineers, teachers of teachers. So we have to get ready for the age of co-creations. Um, so if we all get ready for this, the ride will be more smooth. <laughs> that is such a wonderful note to end on. Um, I think we've all felt enormously privileged to be Thank with you. Rafika and Adol today. So I would like to ask us to give uh, Rafika a huge round of applause. By the way. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much.